We covered the problem. There's a little bit of resolution this week. Okay, Natalie, on the notes at the top of page one on the left, could you read verses one through eight? Yes, I can. There's a time for everything and a season for every activity under the heavens. Therefore, do not be Time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to uproot, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to tear down and a time to build, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to, a time to mourn and a time to dance, a time to scatter stones and a time to gather them, a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing, a time to search and a time to give up. <coughs> A time to keep and a time to throw away. A time to tear and a time to mend. A time to be silent and a time to speak. <clears throat> a time to love and a time to hate. A time for war and a time for peace. Okay, so how does the first one of these, got a lot of um, little comparing couplets there. Um, how does the first one, which is verse 2a, the first part of verse 2, how does that relate to all the others? There's a beginning and an end of everything. Okay. Um, some of those are beginnings and endings, but um, I wouldn't say that war is a beginning and peace is an end. So some of them don't fit that, but you're right, some do. But there's a... There's, a, There's just a time for everything. Right. So that's the whole theme, yeah. It covers most everything of... Everything that happens in life. Mm-hmm. Yes, very good. Everything you do in life. Very good. But there's an, another way in which that first line is separate from all the rest or relates to all the rest. And Debbie's on the right track with everything that happens in life. Uh, I don't know that that relates to mourning and Well, um, is it every activity under the heavens? That one's personal. Yeah, I thought you were on the first one. Yeah, well, so the, the being born and dying relate time wise to all the activities that are done in life. God made that plan for everything. Yes, and all those activities happen in between those. You're born and you die, and in between, it's full of all these activities. So that first line frames all the activities. Does that make sense? You're born, you die, but in between, you're planting, you're uprooting, you're killing, you're tearing, you're mending, you're mourning. All those things happen in between being born and dying. So the answer is frames all the activities? Yes, it frames them. You could write. Actually, the true word here is a silence, a time for everything. That's what you're saying. Right, yeah, that sums it up. Very good. What was that that you just said? The first line. Mm -hmm. um, for the activities that are going to happen in your life. Okay. So, there are probably more than seven, but seven things that this poem shows about life. Obviously, since it was originally written in Hebrew, we're not seeing any of the rhyming or you know, sound play happening, but we can tell it's a poem. Uh, so what are some things this poem shows about life? That there's a season for every activity under the heavens. Okay, good. What else? That for the sad, there's the good. For the dying, there's the living. For the weeping, there's laughing. Like there's an <clears throat> Yeah. Um, you get... Um, it's not all depressed. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, which is good because so far this book has been pretty depressing. It's not all depressing. It's not all happy. And that, um, I actually hadn't thought about this before, but that helps you understand this whole book because most people are like, well, I just want to think about the happy things. Like, well, life isn't just happy. There's two different kind of things. Balance. Yeah, and you need to see both and you need to know about both. Yeah. If you've never been sad, then you'd be like, what's happening? That's, that's so, just what I am all the time. Just, to sum it up, there's good and there's bad in everything? Um, oh, I don't know. I don't think that's a summary of it. I mean, that's often true. Um, but there, there is definitely different sides of life. Um, which, which helps you understand the purpose of this book. Um, but what about, um, well, um, here's what I had for number one. Uh, it's not, the order is not important other than for the point I'm going to try to make at the end. Um, there is a right way and a wrong way to do things. Because if you're uprooting when you should be planting, that's going to be a big disaster. Right? If you, if you don't do things at the right time, right, if you refrain from embracing when you should embrace, well, then, you know, the bride might cancel the wedding. You see what I mean? Okay, so there's a right way and a wrong way to live. Um, secondly, um, this is a very proverbsy thing. Um, the the world that God has made, the created order, um, you have a place in it, and if if you refuse to fit your place, you will mess everything up in your life. You can't be like, well, you know what? I don't want to plant right now. I think it's a time to dance. Well, wait a minute, there's a time to dance, but right now is a time to plant. You see, that's like a very a fool thing, to do things at the wrong time. That's what shows the design. Right, yeah, the design of God's created order, exactly. And you have to live in line with that design. Yes, a surrender, a submission to this is the way God has, this is the life God has given me. And, and by doing that, you're always looking to the Holy Spirit to guide you, whether it's pro proper timeline, proper time, proper time. Um, yeah, certainly. Yeah, the Holy Spirit's, Holy Spirit's guidance is important in our lives. Okay, so here's where it gets a little bit tricky, but also good. <laughs> um, so we have to live our, line, our lives in line with God's design, like Al said. If you want to make your life in, in every aspect of life. I mean, this covers, I mean, it doesn't cover, it doesn't cover you know, lacing your sandals or whatever, but it pretty much covers all of life. That's why it's, there's so many different things. So many different arenas of life. There's time for this, a time for that. All, in all arenas. So that does give some meaning to our mundane human tasks. Last week we talked a lot about it's Hevel. I'm trimming my bush, it's Hevel. Right? But in this world that God has made, there's a time to do those mundane tasks. And, and so, in one sense, doing those simple tasks, well, you know what, I have to do laundry, I'm not going to change the world, nobody's going to get saved because I did my laundry, but I just need to do it, right? But in doing those things, you're submitting to the life God has given you. So that is helpful, and last week we were only focusing on the problem, and it seemed like there was no meaning in anything. Well, that, that is one area in which... It, 
one little hint at some of the meaning that there is in life. Now, in order to follow God's design, what do you need? This is number three. Obedience. Good, yes. What's she say? Obedience, that's true. Um, do you need God's Holy Spirit? Okay, let's think about um, this book, though. That's certainly true. Um, but this book doesn't really focus on the Holy Spirit and its guidance. There's some... Um, yes. What did you say? I, I said it's Old Testament, so uh, the Holy Spirit... The Holy Spirit had a different um, way of doing things, yeah. Um, but if there's, a, if there's a time to tear down and a time to build, and you better do it at the right time, do the right one at the right time, what do you need to know? To know when to do what? The material. God's you, need word. you need wisdom. Wisdom. So you could do the right thing, but you do it at the wrong time and you mess it up. You need wisdom. Wisdom from God. Yeah, common sense. Too. The common, yeah. Well, wisdom and common sense have a lot of overlap. Um, yeah. <clears throat> okay, so, and this is wisdom literature, and that is a big theme of it. To, to show that, like, it's not just, here's the list of things you do. It's, well, these are things you do, but these are also things you do. You better not do these when you should be doing these, and vice versa. So you need wisdom. That's number three. So we had there's a right way to live and a wrong way. We had we're living by God's design in every aspect. That's number two. And now number three is you need wisdom. Now, those three go together in a group. That's why I... That's why I put them in the order I put them in. Um, but, but now it starts, they start to change because there's other things you can learn from this. There's a, like a, a darker side to what you can learn from this poem. Number four is, do we have this much wisdom? Think about it. If you need wisdom in all these activities, in every arena of life, in every aspect, you have to make sure you do the right thing at the right time. And you do the other thing, which would have been wrong, at a different, different time. It would be much simpler if God had designed a world that's just, here's a list of things you should do, here's a list of things you shouldn't do. And that's it. We get free choice. Well, we have free choice, but we also need wisdom to know when to do what. Yeah. It, you could be reading your Bible and sinning because you should be doing something else. You should be helping somebody. Yeah. Right? Like, I mean, think about the Good Samaritan, right? The priest is like, well, I could help that guy, but I better be on time to my temple thing. That's for God. God's more important than this guy. Right? Jesus had a priest and a Levite who won't help this guy laying on the road, half dead. You, can, you could see, and I've done it, that kind of mentality. You know what? There's a right thing and a wrong thing, and I'm doing the right thing, so... Well, that, that, reading your Bible, going to the temple or to church, those are good things, but you need wisdom, too. You can't do them all with that. Right, there's a time to do different things, yes. And that's, that's uh, difficult because it's so much. It's everything in life. Okay, but so... If you totally surrender to the Lord, wouldn't you know the, if, you lead, if you're being led by Him, wouldn't you know? Um, yes, but even so, there's still, it's not like... I got saved, I'm surrendered to the Lord, I'm done. You still need training, you still need discipleship, you still need the Word of God, and you still need wisdom. And reading this book and trying to sort through this is one of the ways in which God builds your wisdom. And that's when I don't know what to do, I just pray and I ask God, show me what I'm supposed to do. Yeah. Well, that's good because that's, that's number two, you're, you're surrendered. You're saying, God, 
I don't know what to do. I'm going to submit to you. Please just show me. I just want to do what you want. That's very good. Okay, but number four, the darker side is it's hard to have that much wisdom. Okay, here's another thing you can learn from this. Again, slightly on the darker side. Our lives are very full. Like If you think about that list, you're born and you die. And in between, look at that list. You're planting, you're uprooting, you're killing. There is a time to kill. There is a, there is a time to kill if someone breaks in your house. And it, I mean, think about the world that Solomon and those people lived in. In the spring when kings go out to war, that's what you do in the spring. And if you win, well, you take them all as slaves. Everyone around you, that's the way they see the world. And these people, they saw invading armies come into their town. And that's the time to kill. It's not, it's not ideal, but this is, this is the world. That's what Solomon is teaching. Yeah, yeah, how do you know? We it, have to have discernment on that. Yes, so discernment and wisdom. wisdom. Yeah, both. Very good. So what's number four? So number, well, number four is, yeah, you need wisdom and discernment. Number five is our lives are very full. I mean, planting, building, searching, mending. By the way, people in the ancient world, world worked a lot more than we work. Um, their evening entertainment was... You know, was yeah, I'm exhausted because I just worked from sunrise to sunset. Now I just have to build this fire and cook this food. Okay, I'm like, I got to better gut this animal so we can eat tonight. Um, okay, number six. Five is our lives are very full. Our lives are full, very full. A lot of activity, a lot of work. Well, the number six, what is missing from this list? There, there is something, a very important key part of life that is not here. A huge aspect of life. Okay, well, that is huge. <laughs> um, yeah, we'll talk about that being missing later. You're right, that is missing. But... Just as far as things you do between two one, you spend about a third of your time doing this one. Yeah, there's no rest or sleep mentioned in this list. It's all do 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 do. You got to do this, then you got to do that, but don't do this at the wrong time. Do this, do that, do that. No rest mentioned. We're running around doing lots of things, busy, busy, busy. I think there's some blanks there. No rest and busy. And in line with the thinking of Proverbs, we're busy at a lot of hevel. We're busy doing a lot of hevel. Just meaningless stuff. Is that seven? Uh, that is six. six. Yeah, I, I think I put three blanks at six. So the rest is missing. We're busy. And in a sense, we're busy at a lot of hevel, a lot of meaningless, just... Just stuff you got to do in life, but it's not. There's no fulfillment. There's no meaning. Okay. Um, now, number seven is a little bit complicated. The last one, but uh, I think it's important. And I, boy, I read this so many times before I noticed this. So think about what we're saying. You're running around. It doesn't mention rest. I think not mentioning rest helps clue you in. Like it doesn't say there's a time to work and a time to rest. It doesn't say that. And, and, and I, I know that I'm 99% sure that was in the teacher's mind when he said this because of what comes later in the book very shortly, as we'll see later today, but that he doesn't mention the rest thing. Um, 
So I think the author wants you to see, the teacher wants you to see, that we're running around at one point building something and at another point in time tearing that thing down. That sounds like Hevel, doesn't it? I'm working really hard to build this thing. You know what? At some later time, I'm just going to be tearing this thing down. So, the, the, the very structure of every single line here shows you that there is a Hevel aspect of life. Even the biggest things in life. Guess what? You're born, but you're going to die. There's just the very structure of the way these things are balanced. It, it shows you that there's meaning in the mundane things and all the things we said. That was one through three. But it also shows you that there's a Hevel aspect of life. Sometimes happy and sometimes sad. Yeah, and sometimes when you're happy, you know you're going to be sad. Later. And, and vice versa. Okay, so here as an example of this, what if I told you um, that you need to spend every waking minute, this is hypothetical, every waking minute typing an essay? That is your, that's, if, you know, if, uh, obviously this can't, couldn't happen, but if it did, and that was your purpose in life, was to type that essay. By the way, every night while you sleep, I'm going to delete it all. Oh, that's discouraging because while you're working away, running around, doing research, oh, this is going to be such a good point. Oh, that's, a, oh, I typed that just right. I'm really going to make it clear. It's all going to get deleted. That's how this book started. You're not going to make a difference. No one is going to remember it. You're born, you run around and do a lot of stuff, and then you die. And a lot of the things that we do in our lives, they get undone. All right? And you see it here. There's a time to gather stones and a time to scatter them. So with that in mind, the next verse right after the poem, I think, makes a lot more sense. Um, Debbie, could you read uh, 9 and 10? What do workers gain from their toil? I have seen the burden of God has laid on the human race. He has made... Okay, no, just 9 and 10. Oh. Just those next two verses. With that in mind, that aspect of this poem in mind, What do you gain from your toil? It's just going to get undone. And then he says, I see the burden God has laid on the human race. We have to do all these activities. You have to. But in at least one sense, it's all hevel. It's all meaningless. It's all pointless. It's all just going to get undone. But it also helps you give us prophecy. And also contentment. Right. And so... Um, so like we talked about last week, there's two different sides. It is true that there's meaning and you should find satisfaction in your work and all the joy passages. But it's also true that in another sense, it doesn't matter. No one's, uh, in 200 years, no one's going to remember any of it. Don't we do any of these kind of things in heaven? Well, that may be so, but that's really not the point of the author's point here. Yeah, I agree, but that's really not, that, that's true. Both what you said is true, but it's not quite his point here. I think the point is that God has laid upon us, if God laid it upon us, then it must have been something that needs to be done. Yeah, it does have to be done, but it's a little bit depressing. And it's a little bit like, how do you find satisfaction? I mean, think about the essay thing. I know that's an extreme example. But once you realize that's what happens... But I think that over time, I, like for me, it's always been uh, what seems like heaven. Well, God's arranged it, so I got to do it. So I'm going to do it and be happy about it. Okay. It doesn't matter who remembers it because he told me to do it. So right. And, and that's why the very next line. So he's like, What do you get from your toil? I mean, obviously, that's a rhetorical question. You don't get anything. It's all heaven. What a burden God's laid on us. But then it comes to the next line, 11. 
Uh, Marty, could you read verse 11? Just the first line of it, actually. Think about that. That's a beautiful line. Yeah, he has just got done saying, because there's a time to build and a time to tear down, then in a sense the building is meaningless. It's heaven. Okay? He just got done making that point, and psh, what do you gain? And then he says, but God has made everything beautiful in its time. So if you do it, if you build, even though you know it's going to get torn down later, if you build, do your, right now it's time to build. That's what God has laid on me, like Al was saying. This is the time to build. I'm going to do it. And later, well, this barn isn't useful anymore. It's time to tear this down. There is a way in which God has made this life, this life we're bound by time and all this, He's made it beautiful. And so it keeps going back and forth. It's heaven, but there is a sense in which this world of time that God has made is beautiful. So he's like, it's heaven, yet it's beautiful. And so you see that, um, you know, there's a time, like we talked about the light side and the dark side of this poem, right? It gives meaning to life, but it also makes it hard to find meaning in life. It makes it nearly impossible. Okay. And yet, so we live in this world by time, everything's beautiful in its time, and yet, look at the next line of 11, Marty. He has also set eternity in the human heart. Every, every, no, no, just that line. Everything is beautiful in its time, and yet he's put eternity in our hearts. Eternity is separate from time. Eternity is not just a really long time. It's, it's something genius. more. Yeah, it's something more. I'm thinking of the depression time. Number one, because that's I I wasn't old enough for that, but I was very young, and everything was beautiful in its time, because no matter what was going on. It brought families together and they, we got stronger and um, closer. So in its way, it caused more beauty. Well, uh, let me... But there's a lot, there's a lot of, of bad things. But yeah. I'm looking at it how, how in its time it was beautiful. Okay, let me point, point to the way in which the author of the book we're studying right now would, no, no, would see that point. <clears throat> Why was there a certain beauty to the depression? Because all the hevel had been stripped away and people were just trying to live their life. I mean, think about the 20s and all the excess that people had. And then when 29 came and it all crashed, it stripped, it stripped everything down to just, you know, we got to get by and our neighbors have to get by. Everybody worked to get <clears throat> So, the point is, if someone during the 20s when everything was great and the stock market was great, had a lot of money, if they were reading this book, they'd say, you know what? A lot of what I do is hevel. Maybe I should focus on what really matters. That's part of the point of this book. And then, of course, God stripped it away to help people. But, um, okay, so it just keeps going back and forth. It's, what do you gain? But it's beautiful in its time. But there's eternity in our hearts. Now, think about that. Eternity in our hearts. Is anything in this world of time ever going to satisfy that? No. Okay. God has put eternity in our hearts, and yet, the rest, now, Marty, the rest of verse 11. He put eternity in our hearts. We yearn for something more. But you can't understand what God has done from beginning to end. You cannot understand it. We, he's put eternity in our hearts, and yet we cannot comprehend eternity. That's part of the root of why there's this disconnect in our lives, because there's eternity in our hearts, but we can't understand eternity. Is that what number seven is? 
Um, I, it's below number seven. There's a. Um, wh what we do is undone. It gets undone. Sorry. Which is is discouraging. So. There's beauty to this world of time, yet he's put eternity in our hearts, yet we can't comprehend eternity. So we're eternal beings living in a very temporal, finite world. And that's part of the root of the disconnect. You know, buildings get built. 50 years later, they tear it down. Yeah, it. that's exactly what he's saying here. Okay. Let's see here. Um... So still in the red box below, still in verse 11, um, we need to see things from God's point of view. There's eternity in our hearts. But we can't and will never be fully satisfied in this life. That one is thanks to John MacArthur, that little insight there, that first line in the red box. Yes, okay, 12 and 13. Let's see. Um, Bev, could you read 12 and 13? I know that there is nothing better for people than to be happy and to do good while they live, that each of them may eat and drink and find satisfaction in all their toil. This is the gift of God. Yeah, it's another joy passage. Okay, so, um, so we'll never be fully satisfied, and yet... Finding satisfaction, finding what satisfaction you can is good. Well, it's, <clears throat> um, we, okay, so we'll never be fully satisfied, and yet you live your life, you find the satisfaction in your work and in the things you can, that's good. Yet it's a gift from God. In other words, you can't get it on your own. What was the first two empty blanks? We can't and we'll never be fully satisfied. Yet finding... So we're still in the thick of the problem. It's going back and forth. There's meaning, there's no meaning. You can find satisfaction, you can't find satisfaction. You can't get it on your own. It's a gift from God. That's a key... Step on this this journey that the teacher is taking through all the meaninglessness of life, he, he is progressing somewhere. Well, and this fact, it's good. Okay, in the red box, can't satisfied, good yeah. gift. Those are the good, yeah. and then gift. Finding what satisfaction you can is good. Oh, okay. Yet it's a gift from God, which means you can't just get it on your own. Okay. Then it goes back, and then 14 and 15, it goes back again. Um, let's see. Uh, back to Natalie. Can you read 14 and 15? I know that everything God does will endure forever. Nothing can be added to it and nothing taken from it. God does it so that people will fear him. Whatever is has already been, and what will be has been before so, here's another step. We see now part of why God has set things up this way. The, okay, so you should find satisfaction in your work. But you can't, you can't find satisfaction in your work because only God's actions endure forever. That's what that one is? Yeah. Yeah. So the whole point of the poem was your actions won't endure forever. You're planting, but guess what? Later on you're going to uproot that. You'll have to do it all over again. Plow all again. Sow all again. Reap. That was the time poem. Your actions won't endure forever. Only God's actions endure forever. Because your actions... <laughs> You, okay, so 14 and 15. You can't get satisfaction from your work because your work won't endure. It's going to be undone, and maybe by you next year. Only God's actions endure forever, so fear Him. That's the point. That's one of the purposes of this life being this way. 
I got to find meaning in a meaningless world. Only God has meaning. Well, wow. I better fear God. Okay. <clears throat> so all this about time and our limitations and God's greatness. Do you have that in your box? Yeah. In red, yeah. So all this, all this, page one is all about time and our limitations, because we are limited by time, and God's greatness and the hevel of all of it. So there's the fearing God because of his greatness, but like the depressingness because it's all hevel. All of this culminates in judgment. Do you see the last line? All this, all these activities. So you're being judged whether you did them or not properly? Well, look what it says about time. The little poem, verse 15. Whatever is has already been. So this is all about time. What will be has been before. There's nothing new under the sun. We've seen this stuff before. But now there's the new, the new step added that he's been building to here. God will call the past to account. So what's happening here is at the beginning of the book, we saw, okay, this is time. So, oh, you're doing something and you think it's something new. This B is just a letter of the alphabet randomly. You think it's something new? Well, you know what? They've done B before. And if you try to do something else, well, they've done that before. No matter what you do, they've done it before. Whatever is has been before. And what will be, that's been before too. But now a new step is added. At the end of all of it, God will call the past to account. So has the world already been created once before because it's already been done? No. The world was created once. But he's talking about our lives. If you like say, guess what? I wrote a beautiful poem. Well, you know what? People have been writing poems for thousands of years. So I'm not saying you shouldn't write a poem. I'm just saying whatever you've done, it's all been done. Don't think you're something significant and you're going to change. I mean, you, you could change the world in small oh, ways. Yes. But it, the point is we are so low. Nothing we do is going to change the continents. It was nothing new. But what's added here now is, but remember, God is going to call it all to account. This is all this. To generation, there's nothing new. Right. Okay. Yes, this is a huge step in the journey. At the beginning, he's like, oh, it's all meaningless. It's all, it's all been done before. You can't do anything new. You're going to live. You're going to die. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. There's no meaning. And now is the step, well, hold on, though. It's all going to be called into account. Yes, judgment. And he just got done saying fear. Judgment is the great terror of the human race. All cultures have all been terrified of the judgment that comes. And yet it's our only hope. That someday God is going to make everything right. This world of frustration. I mean, Hevel, think about Abel. Hevel means Abel. You constantly, in this book, you're constantly reminded of Abel because of the word, but also because of the content. He's just trying to give a sacrifice to God and he dies for it? What a world of frustration and meaning, pointlessness. But God brings it all to account. God will make everything right in the end. That's what judgment is all about. He put judgment on Cain right away. Yeah, he did, although that didn't do much good for Abel, though, did it? You see, so <laughs> there's just these two sides. Okay, um, now we're not going to get into 16 and 17. I'll just sum them up for you. There, he's, then he starts talking about judgment. In human judgment, there's all this corruption, you know, with, you know corrupt judges. Um, and, but the judgment section ends with the verse that I put in green at the bottom of page 1. Um, Deb, could you read that, the green verse there? God will bring into judgment both the righteous and the wicked, for there, for there will be a time for every activity, a time to judge every deed. You see the brilliance of how this comes full circle? There's a time for everything, but at the end, there's going to be a time for judgment. 
It starts with every activity under heaven. It says there's a time for judgment of every activity. That just sums up everything that's in here. Yes, it really does. Okay. Page two. <laughs> that was a lot on page one. <clears throat> okay. Um, Bev, could you read the verse at the top of page two? It's, uh, it's like a whole paragraph. I also said to myself, <clears throat> as for humans, God tests them so that they may see that they are like the animals. Surely the fate of human beings is like that of the animals. The same fate awaits them both. If one dies, so dies the other. All have the same breath. Humans have no advantage over animals. Everything is meaningless. All go to the same place. All come from dust. And to dust all return. Who knows if the human spirit rises upward and if the spirit of the animal goes down into the earth. Okay, well, that's right there. Stop there. <clears throat> um, whew. Okay, so what's going on here? The last verse, verse 21, was a question. Who knows? if the human spirit rises upward and the spirit of an animal goes down into the earth. Who knows if we have an advantage over the answer? So, that question, who knows whether or not we, there's an afterlife, essentially. It's faith. It's a good What's the true answer to that question of who knows? God. Only God. Because Only God. none of us have ever gone and come back. I know there's books about it. Do You don't need to read those books. Sorry. Only God knows. That's the true answer. But in the teacher's mind, there's, there's also a rhetorical answer. You know a rhetorical question, right? We don't. Yeah. Nobody does. Nobody knows. What do you mean by rhetorical? I don't know. A rhetorical question is like, oh, it's like a question that you don't, nobody needs to answer because the question makes the statement for itself. Like, well, what am I supposed to do? You're not really looking for an answer. You're showing, well... <laughs> That puts me in a bad situation. It's like, it's like making a statement with a question. So really, the teacher's making a statement. Who knows whether or not there's an afterlife? How can we really know? He's saying there's no way to know. But there's this other side that says, well, you know what? God knows. Okay, so what's going on here is that we're starting to see that the teacher is trying to figure out life totally on his own. And that can only lead you to despair. And you see the despair. It takes you to a point where you're like, I don't even, how can I even know there's an afterlife? Now, he doesn't question God. In the ancient world, the idea that there was no God was ridiculous. If you said, what if there's no gods or God or anything? They would laugh at you. We know there's a God. The question is, which God? That was what was going on in the ancient mind. So he's saying, well, we, of course there's a God. I mean, there's a world here. It had to get here somehow. But what if we don't have an afterlife? What if we're just like the animals? So that's the kind of, so thinking it through on your own, that's the conclusion that it leads you to. And notice the contrast with Proverbs. Remember Agur in Proverbs? I don't know if you were there for that lesson. But Agur is like, God is so high above me. <laughs> I can't know anything without him telling me. I need God's word. But the teacher, he comes to this conclusion. God is so far above me. I can't know anything. Period. I can't even know if there's an afterlife. Well, how did Agur, the guy who just spends like a paragraph talking about how stupid he is, how can he come up with the answer? And the smartest man to ever live can't. Because Agur says, I can't know anything unless God tells me. I just, I need to listen to God. And Solomon's like, I'm going to figure this out on my own. I'm going to think my way through all of this. And it just leads him to, just, to despair. Okay, and now a little joy passage. Hooray! Marty, could you read that? Verse 22. So, so that there is nothing better for a person than to joy, enjoy their work because that is their lot. 
But who can bring them to see what will happen after them? Okay, now this joy passage is very significant because so far in the book, it's like, oh, I don't know about all that depressing stuff, but I like the joy passages. And now you see, oh no, if I only have the joy passages, that's why I have that little diagram there. Life is a very complicated thing, so I made a weird shape. And you can look at it just from the green, happy point of view, but then there's the teacher's point of view, which is everything is hevel, the depressing side. People want to just look at it through the happy lens, but if you do, this is where you come to. Who knows if there's an afterlife? We're just like animals, so let's just enjoy our life because that's our lot. That is dangerously close to the worldly mentality of we're just mammals, so let's just find what pleasure we can. I wonder if that's where that came from, that we evolved from mon monkeys. Well, that's a long story. Um, but, but yeah, this is the roots of it. If you try to see life without God, you have to come up with we are our animals. You have to. So, but do you see how a joy passage separated from God is really just a hedonistic, let's just find what pleasure we can because that's the, nothing after this. <clears throat> okay, so this joy passage shows why we need to understand Hevel. Okay, so um, here's what we need to think. No, there is meaning, and I have to figure out the meaning of life guided by Scripture, but figuring it out will involve some of these depressing truths that are in the book of Ecclesiastes. Okay, we need to cover this little section of chapter 4 very quickly, uh, 1 through 3. Um, Bev, could you read those, 1 through 3, in chapter 4? Again, I looked and saw the oppression that was taking place under the sun. I saw the tears of the oppressed, and they have no comforter. Power was on the side of their oppressors, and they have no comforter. And I declared that the dead who had already died are happier than the living who are still alive. But better than both is the one who has never been born, who has not seen the evil that is done under the sun. Wow. Okay, so you see this little poem here. Um... He's looking at the oppression. So he's moved on to a new topic, but it's still with the same frame of reference. There's these oppressed, and power's on the side of the oppressor, and they have no comforter, and they have no comforter. It gets repeated because it's poetry, and because that's the emphasis. So, in the green box, to sum up that section, because of the evil in the world, and it's so much evil, and it's so much suffering, and it's so awful, because of that, Therefore, what does he say? It's better to be dead to have never lived. To have never lived. It's better to be a stillborn baby than to see this evil world. Because the stillborn baby doesn't know anything about the evil of the world. They don't know anything. It's better to be dead. Is that what Dan's saying? Well, he, first he says, yeah, it's better to be dead. But then he's like, actually, better than dead or alive, it's better to be stillborn. You never lived at all because this world is so evil. <clears throat> so that's the conclusion that he comes to there. Okay. Bless you. Verse 4 of chapter 4, Natalie. And I saw that one. Mm -hmm. And I saw that all toil and all achievement spring from one's envy of another. Okay. Wait, wait, let's, let's pause. Yes. Is that true? All toil and all achievement spring from one person's envy of another. I don't think so. I don't think so either. Okay, let's give a vote if you think so, yes or no. No. That's what kind of person you are. <laughs> okay, so we got some no's and some yeses. <clears throat> Let me just say, obviously not 100% of all work is out of envy. But a lot of it is. Yeah, a lot of it is. Okay? 
What do you mean by so, envy of another? Well, let me just put it this way. Um, let's say um, your neighbor has really nice, well-shaped hedges. Your hedges are kind of out of control. Well, you want your so you got to be like, geez, I gotta. I don't want everyone driving by to think, well, there. So I got to go trim my hedges up nice too. So that work was really out of envy. You spend half your life in that. You spend half your life you trying a nice to. Car you want. Yeah, it's they call it keeping up with the Joneses, right? Well, like everything through our childhood to adulthood is pushing to achieve that which you see others have. Well, they got this. In order to get that which you want, you need to go to school. You need to get. Yeah. There's nothing wrong with the hard work. Okay, yes, it is set up that way. That's why sometimes people in super poor countries are way happier. Because they're like, yeah, I'm living in a hut, but so is everybody else, so it's fine. So the answer to the question is yes? Um, for pretty much. M much of it, not all of it. Of course not all of it, but much of it. Um, <clears throat> yeah, well, I'm not right. <laughs> he's right. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> yeah. So, and he's like, then that's meaningless. I'm chasing after the wind. If you're trying to keep up with the Joneses. That is meaningless. So not only wants to say there's nothing wrong with hard work, but there is something wrong with hard work if it's motivated out of envy. That is wrong. Yeah. Yes. I'm not saying 100% of everything you do is out of envy. Sometimes you just want to provide for your kid. But sometimes you want more than just provision. That, yeah. And your eyes look to God. Well, that's called greed. Yeah, envy is what he calls it. Mm -hmm. Okay. And that it, we know that is chasing after the wind. Now, he gives this little poem, and this is really key because it's like, well, then how much should we do? This is, this is the exact point Natalie's bringing up. Okay, well, if that's true, then how much should we do? And he gives great little three-part answer in five and six, and I have a little diagram for it. I think it'll make it very clear. Deb, could you read five and six? Yes. Fools fold their hands and ruin themselves. Okay, wait. That's what Natalie's talking about, letting your house go to pot. Right? Okay, keep going. Better one handful with tranquility than two handfuls with toils, or toil, and chasing after the wind. Okay. So fools fold their hands. You see a lot of hands in these verses. Fools fold their hands and ruin themselves. Better one handful with tranquility than two handfuls with toil and chasing after the wind. So can you fill out my little hand diagram there? Those are hands. Like this. These are hands like this. Box one. Don't put anything. Those hands are empty. The fool's just like this. I'm not going to do any work. I'm not going to do anything. That's laziness. It's laziness, and they ruin themselves because their hands are empty. Both hands are empty, so leave the first box empty. Those are fools. You can write below. I left a little space to write fools. And ruin is what that brings. Yeah. It brings ruin. Now, Verse 6 is the next two boxes. Better one handful. So what you can do here, um, you've got this little hand. Sorry, that's very poor, the drawing of a hand. But you've got this little hand. In one of the hands, put something in it. They've got... It doesn't matter what one. It doesn't matter what one. One handful. And below it, so the, the full, the empty, both empty hands brings ruin. But one handful below it, you could write tranquility. I think it might be spelled wrong there. I don't know why. Tranquility only has one L. But anyway. And that is better than having two handfuls. So the last one, fill up both hands. And what you get below it is you get toil and chasing after the wind. So you've got the, the lazy fool who won't do anything and they ruin themselves. You've got the one who's obsessed with envy and trying to, like, like Al was talking about, you're just always keeping up with the Joneses. 
And they've got it all. They've got the in-ground swimming pool, and they've got the fancy car, and they've got the house and the keys, the Florida Keys, and this other house here. They've got it all, but their life is full of toil and chasing after the wind. And they will never be satisfied. And in the middle, you've got, yeah, I don't have it all. But I work a little bit. I mean, I don't work a little bit, but I work. I provide for my family. And I have tranquility. And I will never be as rich as the neighbors. What is tranquility? Peace. Peace. Peace in your heart. Or like, like that. Okay. Okay. So, before we turn the page, sorry, <laughs> you turned it. The teacher is right. Stop chasing after nice things. There is useful wisdom to be gained from learning that so many things in this life are hevel. Don't, hevel is like, it's just, it's having the nice thing. It's, the em- it's emptiness. It's meaninglessness. And so many things in our lives are hevel. And that's important to know. Because the person who's keeping up with the Joneses, who's trying to get it, have it all, that person needs to know, hold on. This is all meaningless. That's why Americans go through a midlife crisis. That's the time there's no peace in young people. So, yeah. So you get to like middle age and you're like, oh, whoa. My life is half over, and all I've been doing is trying to get stuff. Right. And that's most of it. Yeah, you get to that point. That, that's what a midlife crisis is. It happens to most people if they've been li- trying to chase after the American dream. Got to get to the next thing. So there is wisdom to be learned from that. A lot of things are helpful. Let me give a quick example my 10 year old daughter some nights i come in just to check on her and tell her you know it's time to be getting to bed and she's sitting at her desk weeping and she's got her school books out i'm like what's wrong and she's like it's too much work i can't get it done i don't understand the number line thing that they're teaching me in my math book i'm like well you know what honey you're just gonna get you know she's like on the last two problems of her math sheet and she doesn't know how to do it you know what, just go to bed. Like, she's like, but I, I, I won't get it. Yeah, I know, you'll get 8 out of 10 on this one homework assignment. It's not the end of the world. You need to get to bed. That's more important. Like, She needs to get some perspective to say, okay, homework's important. I want to get a good education, all that. But at the same time, the one homework sheet you're on is hevel. And I, so I try to give her some fresh perspective by saying, what's the worst that could happen? And she thinks about it for a while. If she listens, sometimes she doesn't listen. But if she listens, she says, well, the worst that has happened is that this marking period, I'll only get A, B on a roll instead of A on a roll. Yeah. In fifth grade, one marking period, you might get A, B on a roll. And she did one time. She was kind of sad about it. You see what I mean? If you're so driven, then you're chasing after the wind. Okay. We're not going to get through all of this, but that's okay. I think we can get through this top section of five. That'll be our goal. We'll finish it next week. So bring this paper next week? No, I'll print it out again. What? Yeah, I know. I'm sorry. Um, Okay, so let's read this section. Bev, could you read uh, chapter 5, 1 through 9, or whatever's there in that first section. Guard your steps when you go to the house of God. Go near to listen rather than to offer the sacrifice of fools who do not know that they do wrong. Do not be quick with your mouth. Do not be hasty in your heart to utter anything before God. God is in heaven and you are on earth, so let your words be few. A dream comes when there are many cares, and many words mark the speech of a fool. When you make a vow to God, do not delay to fulfill it. He has no pleasure in fools. Fulfill your vow. 
it is better not to make a vow than to make one and not to fill it. Do not let your mouth lead you into sin, and do not protest to the temple messenger. My vow was a mistake. Why should God be angry at what you say to destroy the work of your hands? Much dreaming and many words are meaningless. Therefore, fear God. Okay, so a lot of scholars say that this is the heart of Ecclesiastes. So, let's compare this section's first line with its last line. What do you see? Is there anything to compare? They're actually instruction and wise instruction. Mm -hmm. Yeah, guard your steps. Be careful. Be careful. Guard, be ca yeah, be careful. Guard your steps when you go to God and fear God. So the significance of those together? Reverence. That's the focus of this section. Okay, now let's compare the second line with the second to last line. Do you notice anything? Listen. Yeah, listen. Many words are meaningless. So listen, don't talk, right? You get that? Um, so that goes along with reverence, right? You're going, you're going to God. And this is a huge milestone in the book because so far it's been all without God on His own. You got to understand your relationship. <clears throat> yeah. And that is exactly where it goes in the heart of this passage, right? God's in heaven, you're on earth. So let your words be few. Okay, so reverence. So um, the significance of the listen and many words are meaningless. He's not here to listen to you. You're here to listen to him. By the way, what do you think the sacrifice of fools is? Oh, okay, um, I would, I would say that'd be the sacrifice of the wicked. They don't reverence God. Right. Right. It's, it's. Um, they're not reverencing God. They're there, and it's thoughtless worship. Running in, doing my sacrifice. Okay, I took care of it. That's the sacrifice of a fool. They're not like, God is way above me, and He wants me to kill this animal because of what I've done to offend Him. Thank God this animal's provided. So my guilt can be atoned for, at least for this year. Too bad there's not a once and for all sacrifice. <laughs> that comes later. In about a thousand years, the once and for all sacrifice comes after this. Okay, 900, I guess. Anyway, okay, um, so what is the heart of this passage? Well, we've already talked about it because... Billy mentioned it. Um, God's in heaven and you're on earth, so let your words be few. You can just circle that in the center there. Where is that? In the center of the, the verses. Uh, it's at the end of verse 2. God is in heaven and you are on earth, so let your words be few. Thank you. This gives us a clue as to the source of the teacher's problem. Can you figure it out? This whole section, really. And that's at the center of it. His relationship with God. Yes. Okay, that's good. It's more precise than that, but that is definitely it, his relationship with God. Be a little bit more specific about his quest. Fear him and know that he is God. Yes. Well, this section kind of says in a vulgar sort of way, it says, shut up and listen to God. Right. right? And what has the teacher been doing this whole time? Yeah. I studied this and I saw this. and It's a play, but it's only one actor and he just talks the whole time. So, the, yes, and what you were about to say, Bev, that I kind of cut you off, but he, he's been doing this whole quest... Talk, 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 but not listening without God's word. It's all been his own 
figuring it out. So the teacher has been doing his quest on his own, talking, not listening. So without God's word, it's the difference between him and Agor. From Proverbs. Okay, so since we didn't get done, um, let's let's say read seven through eleven. Chapter 7 through 11. I know you already read 7, but it's a key passage, so if you can, read it again.